Ya Binay, what is the status? We can start now, sir. We can start. Yeah. So, good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, all eminent uh, faculties. Our chairperson, Dr. Yatin Mehta, our uh, uh, respected Dr. Deepak Malviya, Dr. Vivukal Nandidas, Dr. Kapil Jirpe, Dr. Ranveer Tagi, and uh, Dr. TLS. And uh, good evening, the audience. So, CritiQuest is the, as you know, that CritiQuest is the platform of Alchem, CME platform, the Alchem, where we, we uh, continuously doing a lot of medical education program. So this is the first Anastasia series in Criti under CritiQuest. On the occasion of uh, World Anastasia Day, which was there on 16th yesterday. So we, we thought we will uh, arrange a new webinar uh, in remembrance of uh, World Anastasia Day and correlate with some uh, subject which is uh, related to the anesthetist and internationalist. So uh, I will not take time because there's a lot of uh, academic uh, inputs to be given by our chairperson, moderator, Dr. Mehta, then our speaker, Dr. Malviya, Dr. Bhukalani Das, panelist, Dr. Jirpe, Dr. Ranbir Tagi, and Dr. PNS. So with that, I will hand over the forum to Dr. Dattat Power, who is our senior medical uh, uh, advisor in Alcare. Dr. Datta, I, I, I request you to introduce our chairperson and then take it forward. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. So, good evening all, myself, Dr. Datta Pawar. And on the occasion of uh, World Anesthesia Day, I would like to welcome all the anesthetists, intensivists, and clinicians to this national webinar on pain management that is Criticus. And uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Mehta, Yatin Mehta as chairperson, and uh, Dr. Deepak Malvi and Dr. Bibu Kalyani Das as speakers for this event. And uh, we also have Dr. Ranveer Tagi, Dr. Kapil Jirpe, Dr. Thirubnana Sambandham uh, as esteemed panelists to discuss the pain management in detail. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Yatin Mehta uh, as a renowned uh, anesthesiologist in the country. Uh, he did the undergraduation from UCMS and MD from EMS. And he then uh, trained in Nottingham, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, he was also awarded with uh, uh, FRCA, FMS, and FISCCM. CCM. So after he completing his specialized trainings, he started practicing cardiac anesthesia at Scott, Scott Heart Institute and uh, was one of the pioneers in cardiac anesthesia and critical care. So he was uh, president uh, of Indian, uh, Indian Association of Cardiovascular Thor uh, Thoracic Anesthesiologists. Uh, he is also president of Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, the Simulation Society of India, and the Research Society of Anesthesia and Clinical Pharmacology. He is a founder of editor of Annals of Critical Cardiac Anesthesia. He has edited textbook on critical care, also Atlas uh, on critical care, and has more than 270 published articles in peer peer review uh, uh, national and international journals, and about 45 chapters in the book. So uh, now I request Dr. Mehta to address this session. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bhavar. Thank you, Sandeep and Alchem for organizing this ridiculous. Timing is perfect. World Anesthesia Day was yesterday. And pain is the main thing which we need to concentrate on. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Deepak Malviya, a dear friend of mine. Besides that, he uh, 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 earlier he was a professor at Gorakhpur Medical College. And now he was director and now is the head of the department of critical care and anesthesia at uh, RML, which is a very famous hospital of, of Lucknow. So he's going to talk about the role of uh, analgesia in uh, uh, critical care. And uh, this is relatively a more ignored topic among the intensivists. So it's uh, absolutely appropriate that he talks about it. So Dr. Malviya, please. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for wonderful introduction. and. Uh, Really, I'm a proud to have a friend like you. And the topic you have given to me by the Alchem company is the my pain management in critical care, which is almost really a, a neglected one. There is no doubt about it. Why is not going? Just a matter of slides are problem. 
This is my institute where we work. Sir, Incidents of pain in the intensive care units, 50 percent. Dr. Valya, the slides are. You have to share the slides. Have you, uh... Share the slide. Just a bit. You get it? No. No, sir. Uh, sir, niche dekhiye green color ka likha hai share screen. Ab niche dekhiye ek bar hai share screen likha hai. Why is not sharing? Which side? Right screen. side or left side? No, no. You are in the middle, in the center. In the center, Q&A, chat and share screen. Share screen. No, no. I'm not getting it. You can just uh, press, first press escape and then you can see the panel. Wherein... Huh? Yes. Click on the zoom, come, uh, click on the zoom icon. Sir. Share screen. First of all, you have to escape. Is yes. escape. No, Click on the no. zoom icon. Click on the zoom icon, sir. Zoom icon. Yes. I click it. Yes. Can you come to the zoom, sir? Okay. Yes, great. Doctor Mehta, could you get it? No. No, oh, no, no. We are not. What happened? Sorry for the table. Assume uh, my uh, Can you can you can, can you send the mail? Uh, can you mail it? Some mail ID. Uh, this slides. Yeah. I can mail it. What is the mail ID? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, we'll call you. We'll uh, mm -hmm. start with Dr. Bibu Kalyanida. Why you start with the Bibu Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll call you, sir. We'll call okay. Hello. Mehta sir, with your permission, we are we are starting with uh, Dr. Das and then we will come back to Dr. Malviya. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. She is one of the senior most uh, anesthesiologists in uh, Kolkata. Uh, she is Director Academics at Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata, Director of Neuroanesthesia, Neuro ICU and Pain Clinic there. And she is one of the landmarks of anesthesia in Canada. That's all I can say. So, ma'am, please go ahead with the, uh, your address. So, hello, everybody. Good evening and uh, belated happy anesthesia day. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. So, um, so to, um, I, I'm very, very nice to see you all. And I have been asked to say some background history of this uh, World Anesthesia Day. World Anesthesia Day. It is known as Ether Day also. Some, some, in some countries, they also call it National Anesthesia Day. And it is celebrated on the 16th of uh, October every year across the country, actually across the world. And it commemorates the first successful demonstration of ether anesthesia by William Thomas Green Morton on 16th of October, 1846 at the Mass General Hospital, Boston, in US. So most of Morton is considered as the father of, father of uh, modern anesthesia. So, in this, on this day, we pay tribute to the pioneers who have contributed to the progress of anesthesia, what we are today. 
and this is the pre thyroidia you can see that um, uh, your the patient is very brutally brutally it is a butchering of it is not surgery it is butchering so you can see here next please and this is the ether day celebration the first demonstration of ether as an anesthetic agent by william green morton and uh, the surgeon was uh, j c warren and uh, the patient was gilbert abbot who had a tumor in the neck just below the jaw and it was uh, uh, removed by uh, warren under anesthesia given by morton next please so this is a simple equipment of uh, morton um, oh my god a uh, morton where he gave anesthesia it is like uh, open drop technique and uh, after anesthetizing morton said that uh, sir your patient is ready for surgery and after completion of surgery the patient was asked whether he had any pain or not and he said no i didn't have any pain only i had a scratch like sensation there then the surgeon dr colin warren he in a loud voice said gentlemen this is no humbug next please and after one month uh, ether was used in uh, other cities of united states and in great britain and you can cannot believe that within 5 months of uh, this demonstration ether was used in india in calcutta medical college uh, under the supervision of dr o soani there he is the surgeon and uh, ether was used in india just after 5 uh, months now uh, as you all know that uh, ether was uh, synthesized by uh, valerius cordus uh, long uh, before uh, this demonstration that is in 1540 and he was used to call it as a, so it was known as sweet oil of vitriol and the word anesthesia was coined by oliver wendell holmes and in 1846 he he requested he requested after the successful uh, demonstration of morton he requested morton to give this state of um, produced by ether uh, after ether the de de uh, ether delivery and if uh, this state should be called as anesthesia because it means uh, insensibility to object of touch next please and this is the ether dome in uh, memory of that event and also uh, william dean morton next please Bo morton was born on uh, 9th august 1819 in charlton masters studied in baltimore college of dental school he uh, he was uh, interested in medicine but uh, because of paucity of fund he joined the dental school and in the harvard medical school he was always in innovative and uh, very enthusiastic to have something uh, to be done so on 13th of september um, morton experimented with uh, for a painless tooth extraction and the procedure was successful so just over uh, over a fortnight he was invited to give this public demonstration and this is the monument of charles at chalton um, uh, the uh, his birthplace next please and this is the tomb of morton uh, this is erected by citizens of uh, uh, boston over uh, morton's um, uh, morton's um, uh, uh, um, Mm, over the uh, tomb of Morton and hello uh, and um, um, he are very kindly uh, it was inscribed by Dr Henry De J Bigelow the uh, famous surgeon and who also witnessed that uh, demonstration so he wrote that William G um, T G Morton uh, inventor and revealer of uh, anesthesia inhalation before whom at all time surgery was agony by whom pain in surgery was averted and annulled and since whom science has control of pain next please so some um, um, information from uh, about the evolution of anesthesia in india in ancient india 600 bc susrut in his susrut sanhita he mentioned that he used 
wine and incense of uh, cannabis uh, for anesthesia. He uh, he was called, he called Sammohini uh, for the induction and Sanjivani for uh, the recovery from anesthesia. Next, please. And Raja Bhose was operated uh, by, uh, by Sammohani and Sanjivani for a brain tumor or something, brain lesion. So in the pre area in India, we use, uh, we used to use opium, wine, Indian hemp, cannabis, and of course, tying up the patient. And ether, as I have already mentioned, chloroform also, first used by Simpson in Edinburgh in 15th of, now, 15th of November, 1847, and two months after it was used in uh, India on 12th of January in 1848. Next, please. Next, please. The first, some information. First Indian woman anesthetist, perhaps uh, the first one in the, um, uh, in the world is uh, Rupabai uh, Pardunji, uh, who was involved in the Hyderabad Commission study under Edward Louis. And uh, there are many uh, persons who, eminent persons, MC Ganguly from Calcutta, Jyoti Prasad Jodhpur, uh, they produce well-documented paper on ether observation. And they said that open ether is practical even in hot weather and with a lot less cost. Alenjana Kaundi, he is in the Presidency General Hospital of Kolkata. Uh, now it is um, uh, said Sukhla Karnani Hospital, this is Kem Hospital, the PG Hospital. He used hypodermic morphine in 1880 for smoother course of chloroform anesthesia. The first documented report of pre-medication in the world. Next, please. Hello. Coming to anesthesia machines, uh, on the 22nd of January 1935, the first ball apparatus was arrived in Calcutta by sea. Uh, the first oxygen plants were installed in Calcutta in 1935, nitrous oxide in 1962. First indigenous balls F rolled out from IOL um, in 1950 with imported parts, and in 56. It was entirely manufactured in India. During the first Indo-Pak war, the portable boil was developed as well as the air uh, trial in apparatus. Next, please. Some interesting facts. As you know that uh, Mahatma Gandhi was operated on, um, uh, on 12 January 1925 for an emergency appendixectomy at Pune. He was given open drop chloroform and a significant event occurred like uh, electricity failed, the battery exhausted from the torch and the surgeon Cornell Maddox completed the surgery with the help of kerosene lamp. Can you imagine? It is in 1925, not very far. So uh, next please. Next please. But 20th century, they uh, had many uh, global growth of anesthesia uh, be it in intubation and airway advances, anesthesia equipment, monitoring devices, drug uh, um, advances, local anesthetics and their delivery system, anesthesia intensive care, pain management, palliative care, and organization of specialities. Next, please. So after 174 years, where do we stand now? We stand now from ether to desflurane, from nitrous oxide to xenon, from barbiturates to propofol, midazolam, dexmedetomidine, from curare to sugamidas, c satracurium, from opium to remifentanil, and from Boyle's machine to EEG, bispectral index guided anesthesia delivery system, computerized drug delivery system, radio frequency generator, intrathecal drug delivery, spinal cord stimulator for pain management. Next, please. Yeah. From bars ventilator to sophisticated ventilators with monitoring facility and with the gas monitoring also. From stethoscope and <coughs> spigo manometer, uh, now isovedal stethoscope, monitoring of various organs from brain to kidney, everything can be monitored. And uh, involvement of the, um, um, the EG system, the MEP, neuromuscular monitoring, uh, neuroelectrophysiological monitoring, SpO2, IA tissue, which is always there, and uh, brain tissue oxygen monitoring, all these devices, intracranial pressure monitoring, everything. 
airway devices from red rubber tube, you now well, we have many uh, supraglottic airways devices and all types of tubes. From McIntosh laryngoscope, now we have a video laryngoscope. From blind nasal technique, we now have um, uh, uh, endoscopic uh, techniques. And uh, from blind techniques, uh, to go for any injections uh, for the root valve blocks, the nerve blocks, the, the lines, and the venous arterial lines, or we can have USG guided techniques now. And computerized analgesic and uh, other um, drug infusion devices. Next, please. Next, please. These are the modern ventilators, um, uh, PCA pumps, anesthesia machines we have now. So anesthesia 2J uh, have advanced monitoring for that. We have separate anesthetic drugs also, better techniques and uh, better um, uh, appliances. So, and a better understanding of the issues related to pain and consciousness. So no patient is too ill for us now, too young for us now, too old for us now to undergo any surgical intervention. We extend monitored anesthesia care to all of them. And now sleep, asleep, awake, asleep technique, awake and uh, anesthesia, and uh, minimum uh, um, induction, minimum uh, um, yeah, in, in infusion anesthesia. All these things are going on. We have also robotic anesthesia in some places now. Anesthesia information managing system management system is now in many sophisticated. Um, um, centers. Next, please. So uh, now the anesthetist role today is multitasking. We are not confined to the operation theater now. We are also involved in critical care. We are involved in emergency medicine, in the pain management system, in the palliative care, and also in the cold blue team, in the brainstem death team, everywhere. And of course, in remote location procedures, we are there. Next, please. So this evolution from 2000 BC to if you go to 2020, we are now here. Next, please. But we owe the pain-free and safe surgeries to those early pioneers who took the initial daring step, often at the immense personal cost. Morton, perhaps, was the inventor but he was certainly the revealer. Modern medicine will always remain grateful to Morton and other unsung heroes who gave us the boon of anesthesia. Next, please. So the theme of this uh, World Anesthesia Day 2020 um, has been said very rightly in this period of COVID-19 pandemic that occupational well-being of anesthetists. If the anesthetist is mentally, physically well, then the patient outcome will be well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Das. Excellent <laughs> overview of where Thank we have you. come from and where we are going. I think <laughs> covers the full spectrum. I Thank remember you. long, many years back, I, had, I think Dr. Zirpe was with me in Boston. We had gone for an ID conference. And I went to see this uh, ether dome, and uh, the, host the, the the place was locked. But I managed to <laughs> pull some strings and get some <laughs> neurology residents to smuggle me in. I said I can't come to Boston and not not visit this shrine. So thank you very much for the overview. Now, thank you. Uh, uh, is Dr. Malvia ready with this presentation? Sandeep? Yeah, Dr. Malviya. Dr. Malviya is there? Yes, yes, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Your presentation yes. is in the screen, sir. You can start. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Dr. Mehta, this is a pain management in critical care, which is a really a challenging topic. This is almost underestimated. And uh, incidences, we can say, is almost a 50% at test and 80% during procedure, this is the pain management scenario. And what are the types of the pain? As a, 
one because of underlying etiology, anatomical lo location, temporal intensity, and underlying etiology most of the time is a nociceptive, inflammatory, neuropathic, or psychogenic pain. Anatomical location is a somatic or visceral. What we are going to talk about, what is the definition of pain? Why is pain measurement been required in critically ill patient? How to assess the pain who is on ventilator? Objectives of the pain management, pharmacotherapy of pain in brief, and what is the message we are going to? The pain is the ISP state, is an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience that is associated with tissue damage or in terms of tissue damage. Yeah. Sometimes we find is delirium, which is also defined as acute confusional state with attention or deficit disorder, thinking, and fluctuating course. What are the causes of pain? If you go on the causes, this is underlying illness or injury. This is physiological changes which accompany the pain, or recent surgical procedure or invasive procedure which can lead to development of chronic pain. Noxious stimuli in the critical care unit, it like tracheal intubation, nasogastric tube, mechanical ventilation, routine nursing care, such as repositioning, they are all cause of the pain. Post-operative pain, this is the most feared problem among the patient and in reticulated treatment, 50% of surgical procedures. More than 80% of the patient experience post-operative pain and 71% experience moderate to severe pain. 75% believe it is necessary to feel pain following surgery. 8% postponed surgery because of the concern associated regarding pain. This is still under minus post of the pain till date, although it's quite better in the last 20 years, two decades, we are managing, but it still is under minus. And that's what is the need of the pain management? Why this is so much important? This is the incidence of significant pain is still 50% or higher in both medical and surgical ICU patients. A study of Chan et al. reported 65.4% of patients had delayed discharge because of the pain man poor pain management. More than 80% of the ICU discharge patients had painful memories and discomfort associated with the endotracheal tube. 38% of remember pain as their, their worst intensive care memory even six months later. 70% of patients recollect experiencing severe pain six months after discharge. 18% were at the risk of the development of post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the film actors after tracheostomy suction, he described the pain of suction just like taking punch biopsy from oral mucosa, just like that. Inadequate management, there's a need to assess the pain, how to assess this, this ISP state, this defines the inability to communicate verbally does not negate the possibility that individual expert experiencing pain and it is in the need of the appropriate pain relieving management. Pain assessment includes location, characteristic, severity, onset, progression, duration, quality, radiation, elevating and exaggerating factor and effect of previous therapies. Example the pain scale, what we assess in the critical care unit, this is either in adult as a verbal numeric scale, visual analog scale, defense or veterinarian pain. But we do it, we patient who, most of the patient cannot communicate. The most common scale is we do the behavioral pain scale or critical care observation tool. We do it. And objectives of the pain management coming to minimize severity of the pain, that is post-surgical pain, continuous monitoring of efficacy of the drugs we are giving, prevention of the development of chronic pain syndrome, control of anxiety ag agitation, particularly intubation, intubated patient, facility rapidly recover and return into full function, improve quality of life of the patient and reduce mortality and ICU stay. Modalities of pain management, that includes the patient control analysia is not practical in a, most of the critical care, critically ill patient. Nurses control is one option, and these are blocks or new excel block or multimodal analysia. For because aspects of a pain disease, as you all know about the WHO analgesic ladder, 
Then the step one is the non-opiate, step two is the opiate, and step three is opiate with the moderate to severe pain. Commonly used pharmacological methods we use is opiates, tramadol, morphine, and fentanyl, or a light paracetamol, NSAIDs, Ketrolac, Diclofenac, Acilofenac, antispasmodic drug is the visceral pain is hyacinth, or adjuvant to is antidepressant and anticonvulsant. Topical analgesics that is muscle relaxant, anti-anxiety medication, and lesion blocks. And as this site of action, this is NSIDs is a noxious to transduction, local NSA transduction to transmission, opiates and alpha-2 agonist is transmission to modulation, and general necessity and opiates, moderation to deception. Opiates, coming to the opiates, this is naturally occurring alkaloids and decreases the pain perception, increases the pain threshold used for moderate to severe pain and available to administer by various routes, especially opiate selection guided by intensity and duration of pain, tolerance and safety, and short acting opiates like rivifentanil for acute pain. Adverse effect includes CNS depression, dyspepsia depression, sedation, histamine release, especially the morphine, stimulates chemodeceptic at zone centers in area postima and causes vomiting, abuse potential tolerance, dependence, and opioid induced constipation. Commonly used uh, preparation is IV or in the patch form, the morphine, fentanyl, or the remifentanil. And most common adverse effect is uh, with the remifentanil is the bradycardia and hypotension, while muscle rigidity is a problem with the fentanyl and accumulation in hepatic impairment. And the most common drug today is we are using every, most of the patients in critically ill patients is paracetamol. This is by inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis in the central nervous system. And doses is 500 to 1 gram every 4 to 6 hourly, maximum 2.5 to 4 gram in 24 hours. Root, it can be oral or intravenous. Effective as both an analgesic and antipyretic, used for mild pain, is scored from 1 to 3. And risk is hepatotoxicity again and contraindication in the patient with liver disease. And the side is the most commonly prescribed analgesic, act binding COX A1 to COX2 enzymes, result in decreased production of prostaglandins from aricolonic acid and used as analgesic, antipyretic, anti inflammatory action and effective for bone and inflammatory pain. And commonly used is diclofenac, ketolinac. Adverse effect are so many of the NSIDs are this gastrointestinal, which is very common, especially in critically ill patients, as the abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and the ulcer and bleeding. And the another is uh, the renal insufficiency, renal failure, and hyperkalemia is protein and proteinuria, especially in critically ill patients. Antispasmodic, hyacinth, butyl. And the dose is 20 milligrams intravenously. Side effects, sleepiness, vision changes, allergies, and triggering of glaucoma. Adjuvant that we are using is not typically pain medication, but may relieve the discomfort. Potentiate the effect of pain medication and reduces the side effect burden. And this, most of drugs used is antidepressant, anticonvulsant, topical analgesic like muscle relaxant, etc. Antipleptic, the common use is gabapentin, pregabrin, or carbamazepine. Antidepressant we use is most common use is duloxetine or emitriptyline. Regional LGC is the one option in critical ill. This is cost effective and provide long and the good quality analgesia. Few with the fewer side effects. As Madam told already, with the advent of the ultrasound use in the critical ill patient and the for the blocks. This is one of the options in critical patient. Central for central and peripheral blocks and can be done by neuro ultrasounded guided neurostimulation. Plexus and nerve block for management of localized pain. Used drugs are usually lignocaine, bupropion, and ropiocaine. We prefer ropiocaine, of course, this, this is a purely block. It. Concentration is again those 0. 0.125 to 0.375%, and duration is almost 7 to 6 to 12 hours, and success rate is with ultrasound guide is almost more than 
and side surveillance. And reasons, what is the reasons for the poor management of pain, especially in ICU? Is this because his main reason is failure to acknowledge the pain and failure to assess the initial pain and failure of the to have adequate pain management guidelines, failure to document pain and failure to access treatment adequacy, <coughs> failure to meet patient expectation, concern regarding opiate deduction and abuse, fear of opioid side effect. Coming to at the end is the stake home messages, critically ill patient may experience pain due to underlying illness or injury. Maintenance of acceptable individualization level of the comfort requires routine frequent pain assessment. Different pharmaceutical options have level of pain management and we must use it. Multimodal analgesia can low, lower the opioid requirement. Thank you very much. <coughs> Over to Dr. Mehta. <coughs> sir, your uh, your mic is... Uh, uh, you have to unmute your mic, sir. sir. Hello everyone, uh, it's Dr. Hemant. Uh, I think in interest of the time, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Yatin Mehta has got disconnected due to technical issues. Okay, so, can you can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Dr. Mehta, yes. we can hear you. Okay, thanks a lot, Dr. Malviya. Excellent uh, overview of pain management. And uh, Thank you. I think we will reserve the question answer at the end because we have a panel discussion also. Uh, so I think we have a presentation from... Uh, LCAM, is that correct? We have a yeah. presentation, no? So, uh, hello? Role of IV paracetamol, you have a presentation, no? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, please do that. Now, I request Dr. Heyman to give his presentation on uh, pain management, uh, role of IV paracetamol in pain management. Thank you. Over to you, Heyman. Uh, first of all, uh, respected faculties, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Malviya, Dr. Tiru Gana Sambandam, uh, Dr. Bibu Kalyanidas, Dr. Tyagi, Dr. Zirpe, uh, and my uh, all the visitors and the audience who are sitting and patiently listening for this session. Uh, wish you all a belated World Anesthesia Day. Hope you had a good day yesterday. So continuing with our talk uh, for pain management, uh, Dr. Malvia has done justice to this topic and somewhere I would uh, like to highlight the role of paracetamol in it. So as sir has already highlighted this pain analgesic uh, ladder by WHO, we find that non-opioids are at the base of that and uh, 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 there are a wide variety of molecules which are available in this category. But do we really have an ideal analgesic uh, to satisfy both the efficacy as well as safety uh, of this uh, area. We know there are many efficacious molecules, but um, we saw that there are safety concerns uh, with other molecules where irrespective of uh, the class, there are uh, some concerns, drug interactions, uh, some complications, organotoxicity, etc. So definitely there is a need of a molecule uh, in this current sector because somewhere the trend now is moving towards the non-narcotic sector because we know the opioids uh, maybe the synthetic ones or the uh, the natural ones have this side effects of respiratory depression nausea vomiting and if there's 
hypothesis that even a single dose can have that abuse potential. So uh, even if we move towards the NSAIDs category, there are always the deleterious effects on the hematological parameters, as well as ulcers, there is CV risk, wound healing, especially in orthopedic surgeries. And hence, there is a need of the hour that we see a molecule which is having a comparable efficacy and definitely provides a superior safety when we compare with the NSAIDs and opioids. And we uh, and uh, I think the safer option which points out and, and which has gained the confidence over the ages is paracetamol due to its safety across all the ages, right from the neonates to the geriatric population and, and not being associated with any side effects, uh, which are all uh, found out with the other comparator drugs. And so not going into deep, just mentioning that uh, this drug has found its place as the first line of agent as an analgesic in mild to moderate pain. And there is a boon of being an antipyretic agent also due to action in the hypothalamus. Uh, and the analgesic effect basically come out from by blocking of the Cox enzyme and uh, blocking the central prostaglandin release, uh, which leads to the pain. So why IV paracetamol? The answer lies in the PKPD, that is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics uh, is very much favorable due to which it doesn't find any variability in any types of surgery or chemotherapy. Uh, no variability between the patients. Uh, the Cmax, that is a concentration maximum after one gram infusion, is achieved in a time span of 15 minutes. So we can have an onset of action within 15 to 20 minutes with a plasma half-life of 2.7 hours. Now we know that the molecule is excreted in urine uh, and is metabolized in the liver. But sometimes uh, the, the minor pathway to the CYP40 might lead to accumulation of its toxic metabolite, NAPQI, uh, which uh, can be resolved by the N injection NAC, that is ns cysteine but uh, that might not be always possible in renally compromised patient and the half-life might be extended. So the dosing interval needs to be extended in such patients. Moving on to the pharmacodynamics, the effect that is analgesic effect uh, starts appearing uh, within five to 10 minutes of the uh, administration. And the peak analgesic effect uh, occurs up, uh, almost after one hour and it lasts for to four to six hours. Uh, again, I would say uh, why IV paracetamol when we have tablet or the rectal formulations, the answer lies in the viability and the variability. Uh, the, there is less uh, amount of variability with IV paracetamol, rapid achievement of the maximum concentration. And that's why IV paracetamol uh, will offer a better care when it comes to the critically ill patient. And fewer reduction, of course, uh, occurs within 30 minutes and effect lasting for six hours. Now this slide provides us the dosing guidelines for paracetamol. Uh, I would like to focus on the a a weight uh, that is 50 kg. Above 50 kg, uh, only thing to look out for is hepatotoxicity if the liver is compromised. If below 50 kg, please go by the dosing guidelines of 15 milligram per kg with a daily dose not exceeding of four grams. As I said, in case of renal compromised patient, the dosing interval should be six hours and the dosing administration can, uh, once uh, the drip is started, it should be finished in 15 minutes, over 15 minutes. Moving on to some clinical evidences of paracetamol, it has definitely shown its efficacy over placebo with a low incidence of adverse effects, as well as drug interactions. Uh, um, Again, the studies have proven time and again that IV paracetamol is effective over the orally administered drugs. But I would like to bring it to the attention that uh, we need to calculate the, even the orally administered paracetamol uh, for uh, looking at the to total toxic dose. That is, if you are administering three milligram IV, then please consider the orally administered paracetamol also, if, if any. Uh, there was a Cochrane review uh, which brought out the findings from 75 studies, which included 7,200 patients mentioning a high quality evidence of single dose IV paracetamol providing an uh, effective analgesia for around four hours. Now, this is uh, about a surgery from head and neck cancer where, where the second arm was provided fentanyl and a preemptive 
paracetamol i think this is a new thing which is being tried uh, uh, with paracetamol ibuprofen showing a good results in preemptive analgesia you know, both for total intravenous as well as regional blocks so it has shown a good efficacy when compared to uh, fentanyl also in terms of adverse effects as well so when we compare it with nsaids also the analgesic effect uh, in uh, both in major as well as minor surgery with respect to even cardiac surgery has shown a good analgesic outcome uh, significant uh, non significant and is similar to that of an nsaid when used in combinations it definitely has reduced the opioid analgesic requirement uh and the outcomes were similar when we compared both with paracetamol or with nsaid that is the combination when it is compared now uh, head head on comparison with fentanyl in mild to moderate pain definitely uh, the study shows that the vas scores are uh, same in both the arms where paracetamol has proven its safety and efficacy in icu patients with mild to moderate severity now the opioid sparing effect uh, yes definitely this should be a concern when the pain patients are treated with moderate to severe pain and the trend my is towards using multimodal analgesia and with this paracetamol has definitely shown a significant decrease in the requirement of opioid and hence we can avoid the unwanted effects of the opioid adverse effects uh, this is from the orthopedic surgery where iv paracetamol has reduced the morphine consumption uh, with a good effect and uh, definitely due to this uh, paracetamol has achieved recommendations uh, for management of acute pain in mild to moderate patients as well as in renally compromised patient so that was for the molecule uh, uh, what what new does uh, alkem bring to the table is the same molecule but uh, same molecule same composition same pharmacological class and same indication uh, what's different so uh, the problem lies over in the plasticizers which are used basically for the packing this plasticizers mainly focusing towards the pvc or the diethyl hexyl thiolate is used commonly as softeners now these are toxic and might leach into your product that is paracetamol and cause damage to the patient uh, so there are papers highlighting the toxic effects of this uh, dhp and due to which uh, we sh uh, should move towards an environmental patient friendly packing uh, that is a flexi bag which provides a self collapsible flexible option low weight environmental friendly uh what advantages it offers to the doctor is uh, ready to administer packing uh, aseptic precautions are maintained by its close infusion system and hence it's easy to handle easy to store and environmental friendly so not taking much time the take home message what i feel should be nsaids opioids are definitely there for, for their efficacy but a safer option is paracetamol when it comes to mild to moderate category clinical studies do prove the efficacy of paracetamol uh, and now that uh, the flexi bag offers advantages of non pvc dhp free packaging along with close infusion system thank you over to dr mehta thank you dr hemant for a very nice uh, overview of uh, paracetamol um i think what now we will do is that we will proceed with the panel discussion and i will address some of the questions my questions to the uh, panelists who have been patiently listening to the two speakers and three speakers um, who have not participated as yet uh, so let me introduce you quickly the three other other panelists besides the speakers dr kapil sarpe really needs no introduction he is the past president of indian society of critical care medicine and is the secretary of uh, indian sepsis sepsis forum of india he is also one of the most he's been one of the most active iscm presidents and he also is the director and hod of the critical neurocritical care uh, he is also the president of the neurocritical care society so he's a very active academician and a clinician it's a pleasure to have you then i have dr ranveer jaghi uh, he's uh, he's the vice president of indian society of critical care medicine and director anesthesia and critical care at synergy plus hospital agra uh, and uh, very active intensivist 
from Agra. Uh, very active, not only in ISCCM, but also in ISC. He's hosted annual conferences of both of these and very fantastic conferences in Agra. And then we have uh, Dr. TLS, the Chief Anesthesiologist, Apollo Cosmetic Surgery, Chennai, Plastic Surgery, Chennai. So thank you all, all of you for coming. And the other two are Dr. Das and uh, Professor Malia. So I'll address my first question to Dr. Zirpe. Uh, so what is the real world experience of uh, use of IV paracetamol in renally and hepatic compromised patients? Dr. Zirpe. Sir, uh, good evening and good evening to the everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me as a panelist. And let me tell you, uh, initially when paracetamol was not available in India in 2004-2005, I used to heard from my colleague who was from the England. They were, at that time, the Europe were very familiar with using the paracetamol in one gram as an analgesic. And then after the launch, in two, I think 2008 or 2010, we have launch of the availability of the injectable paracetamol. It becomes suddenly so widened. It's, it's like a routine uh, analgesic we prescribe in critical care because we have a lot many patients who need the good analgesics which is a renal safe and uh, which has the less toxicity. Uh, coming back to your question sir regarding the renal and hepatic. Uh, let me tell you the uh, paracetamol is though it is excreted in the renal uh, it is safe as per the uh, our uh, practice we are we are prescribing but recently uh, the, my opinion is slightly uh, changed recently when i came across the systemic review and uh, it was a, a good uh, systemic review of the almost 13000 patients in 2026 it was uh, mentioned and they have said that you have to be careful in terms of the if the patient on the verge of the uh, developing the renal injury or if the patient is compromised generally our critical care patients are on inotropes they are hypolemic they are having the sepsis so they are already on the verge of the renal injury and on the top of that if you are not careful with the paracetamol dosing the here issue comes with the dosing uh, dosing should not exceed the uh, routinely dosing should not be exceed 4.5 gram that one everyone should understand but in critical ill patient, I believe that it should not uh, over more than the three gram might be your landed, and that that systemic view suggests that there are the chances of the developing renal uh, injuries are very high uh, if the patient is on the paracetamol. So uh, be careful if you are prescribing the paracetamol one gram, uh, four hourly, six hourly in a, a critical ill patients. You should be more careful. You can make the combinations of the uh, different analgesics where we can keep your patient calm and quiet and the pain free. Secondly, regarding the hepatic uh, involvement, um, though it is metabolized in the uh, liver, generally it is safe in an acute liver disease. It, it doesn't cause the uh, major trauma in a uh, chronic, chronic. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it is very safe in a chronic liver disease. You can go up to the uh, three gram. But in acute liver disease, you have to be uh, careful while using the paracetamol. So you have to have a complete overview of your patient, the clinical condition of the patient, the need of the analgesic, and don't then just rely on the paracetamol alone in such patients. Make the combination and try and uh, have a control over the, your uh, dosing. That's what the, my take on uh, using paracetamol in renal as well as the hepatic uh, involvement. I think that is very nicely covered in both the situations. What is your opinion about the maintaining the sterility and possibility of contamination during administration. Sir, such question should not be asked to the intensivist. We are, we are most concerned. See, what we are concerned in the ICU is the infection. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming across the infection from everywhere. And uh, during this COVID, our staff is compromised. Our healthcare system is compromised. We do not have the adequate number of the staff. We do not have the uh, uh, adequate experience, doctors, sisters. And in such situation, I believe in the infection control practices may have a lot of impact on the day-to-day -day practice. And in this situation, and forget about the COVID, and you are in the pre-COVID and the post-COVID, what is the, my first priority in my ICU is the infection control. So, which of the things, whether it is uh, uh, your IV solutions, whether your injections, whether your uh, different drug deliveries, your instrument, machines, I am I'm most concerned about the infection. And it, it makes a lot of difference to me. I, I, I would like to adopt the such systems which will reduce the handling such system which will help me for the infection control because I'm not bothered about the cost. I'm bothered about the one extra day in my ICU, patient's day in ICU. So if it is going to help, 
yes of course it matters a lot so such a close systems i always welcome whether it is a paracetamol whether it is related to the antibiotic or whether it is in a, any drug delivery concern it is a prime priority and important thing in a critical care setting sir see blood stream infection we all are dreading it particularly in the covid times with immunocompromised uh, patients so i think anywhere close system would be preferable in this sort of situation there was a paper by victor rosenthal from uh, argentina and in in a, a virus iris he demonstrated that between closed system and open system in two icus there was a three times difference in bsi so i think we should... yeah and generally sir uh, to add one we generally the excuses are given that the cost factor i always say that the cost factor i don't look at the single cost factor of the antibiotic or the my iv said i look at the number of stays in I, uh, icu even if my number of days of the patients in icu reduced by one or two days that covers the life risk as well as that covers the cost of the patient i, I never convince my patient that the cost is high so we should not use i always convince that which are the added advantage with this particular drug or this system or the cost which will help them to reduce the cost uh, overall cost of the management as well as the risk to the life so i always prefer such systems which will help me and unfortunately we cannot put a extra burden on our existing compromised system so again these systems will help us for the giving some uh, relief to the my uh, staff uh, about the medication preparation and hand washing and everything so okay. that's why i thank you doctor sir i uh, uh, bring in doctor ranveer jaggi uh, so ranveer uh, how do you when uh, what sort of scenario you will use paracetamol mild pain moderate pain severe pain paracetamol as dr hemant already described most of the things in the their lectures this is an excellent drug or you you can use even in the pregnant women children any age and very uh, safe drug uh, so this for mild and moderate pain we are using in the ot in the icu or even in the ward every place no any side effect even the respiratory depressant sometime contramel and opioid occur in the ward so you can use safely without any risk in the patient so paracetamol for mild to moderate is excellent drug i think everyone is using in india i think the number one drug people are using this paracetamol in the today uh, in the pain management and how do you taper your analysis for taper uh, sorry paracetamol taper when when you need taper for tapering indication when no pain patient just like pain coming for the knee replacement when you replace knee replacement done after 4 5 day you start tapering because the main root of the uh, pain is resolved and if the side effect is more sometime the main side effect is liver toxicity to be aging so then you start tapering comfort tapering you have to counsel the patient or give some alternative drug or some block and you start tapering the tapering problem with the uh, opioid is very difficult when you want to start so start tapering 10% reduction dose by weekly or weekly you can start with the tapering yeah also i think when you are tapering from strong analgesic severe pain when it comes down after a couple of days of surgery maybe that is the time to go through paracetamol from narcotics yeah. to paracetamol yeah. that will be easy way what about the role of adjuvants in analgesia adjuvant is the good drug when used when your primary analgesic drug are not working then you add the adjuvant adjuvant not a primary analgesic sometimes they work as a primary as a tricyclic antidepressant work in post therapeutic neuralgia as a primary but most of the time adjuvant is the secondary you can add like a, they add in the different situation like you had a muscle relaxant you when muscle is tense then you add ye yeah, muscle relaxant you cannot relieve by the nsaid or opioid you had a adjuvant anesthesia analgesia and uh, anxiolytic sometime and uh, some uh, anti anti convulsant anti depressant these are the different drugs you can do uh, neuro for, for neuropathic pain you can add anti convulsant so different adjuvant for different type of pain neuralgic pain acute pain like spasticity or uh, in a uh, stroke patient you carry butrol butrol type to injectable and local anesthetic you can use as a adjuvant anesthesia or analgesic also 
Also, alpha two agonists have been used, no? And that's with chloridine and uh, dexmedetomine yeah. along with the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. also quite so, uh, dexmedetomine people are using OT and ISO as a sedation as well as analgesic. Mm. Also for weaning, in from ventilator when the patient gets irritable, I use yeah. a lot of dex dexmedetomine at that time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, for Doctor uh, uh, T S. Uh, what about the role of closed system, infusion system? Part of it we have already covered. Dr. Thiruna, some of the things. Yes, yes, sir. There is a very, very clear evidence that uh, closed systems are uh, far more superior than open uh, infusion systems. And uh, particularly uh, when we deal with immunocompromised patients, uh, pregnant patients, neonates, um, and um, uh, people with uh, you know, elderly patients. Uh, wherein uh, uh, hospital occurred infections are uh, quite common. Uh, so closed systems uh, are always beneficial and that is adequate proof that uh, when you use closed system, uh, the incidence of uh, infection rate comes from uh, what it is going to be 10 to 3 per thousand uh, when you use closed system. So uh, I, I am for closed systems, but then the thing is, uh, one or two infusions if you use closed systems and the rest probably even if there is going to be a breach even when you use uh, say uh, if you want to administer an antibiotic infusion and that comes uh, and that particular antibiotic comes uh, uh, without a closed infusion system then there is a breach and then there is no point having only one so it has to be a policy decision made from the administration uh, that the entire system or entire infusion systems should be closed, and that is the, that is where uh, the catch is. And what about the environmental friendly impact? Oh yeah, uh, they covered a lot about uh, the PVC and then the DHE. DHP, uh, yeah. uh, so this uh, actually PVC emits lots of chlorine, and then that can uh, even go into the food chain and then uh, come back to us. Uh, DHEP is a softener. It's a flexibility-producing flexi flexibility agent. You know, otherwise, PVC is going to be hard and brittle. When you use these softeners, these are phthalate groups, and these are carcinogenic and mutagenic, and it is nephrotoxic even. So it is prudent that we avoid uh, uh, these kind of uh, PVC, which uh, use these softeners. There are alternates um, which can be used like uh, polyethylene or polypropylene uh, preparations are there. Uh, so those materials are uh, preferably used uh, uh, instead. Maybe uh, a little bit of a cost uh, might be a factor in the initial days, but then I think there will be a switchover uh, sooner or later. Uh, they're going to dump all these. Uh, uh, and they have started to do that in other industries like uh, food industry, packaging industry, and that Particularly, it has to come here into our medical industry too, because you know PVC is quite deliberately used in our industry. So that has to come down, and uh, those softeners needs to go go away. And regarding that, uh, the hepatic impairment question that you asked, uh, whether you use paracetamol, when we use paracetamol IV, the main important thing, the advantage of using paracetamol IV is it bypasses hepatic metabolism. And then that's where the hepatic toxicity is coming down. And preferably in a patient, there is a lot of difference between when you give it orally, the bioavailability, it has to go through uh, the liver and glucuronidization happens. Uh, or oxidation is the one which produces more of a toxicity. And uh, that bypasses, the IV paracetamol bypasses. Renal, yes, okay, you got to adjust the dose. But then in IV, if you are confining yourself to safe dosage limits, I think uh, uh, IV paracetamol uh, will not be a problem when you have an hepatic impairment. I, I, at least uh, uh, not an end stage liver disease or uh, you know, uh, completely decompensated liver disease. Uh, uh, decompensated liver can still take paracetamol. But if that, you have other very, agents, you can avoid. That's a very relevant point, what you said, yeah. Uh, question for Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Das. So what are the pros? Can you summarize the pros and cons of IV paracetamol? Professor Bibukalani, is she there? Yeah. What, was the, what, what was the question? Pros and cons of IV paracetamol. 
pros and cons of IV paracetamol. <coughs> Uh, as you know that I practice neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care. So pros and cons, uh, as uh, already discussed, the, you are very, uh, you have to be very careful in uh, renal and um, hepatic, um, um, uh, hepatic compromise uh, patients. So, but <clears throat> we in the uh, neuro case, uh, <clears throat> in induction, I use uh, till now, we use uh, fentanyl. And then after in the post-operative period, our patients are not very painful. Only the spinal surgery cases, they are very painful surgery. So in spinal cases, we can use paracetamol. The pros is that we can go for multimodal analgesia and it is a safer drug than you cannot use uh, the, now the um, um, NSAIDs. NSAIDs, they are definitely, they will come, uh, cause harm to the kidney. And uh, they definitely will cause uh, any uh, um, uh, the coagulation uh, uh, disorders. So, um, so these are the things, uh, limitations of other drugs. So paracetamol is a bit safer drug in uh, this respect, I, I can tell you. And the uh, cons only uh, the uh, hepatic and renal compromised patients. Uh, otherwise, there is no harm in using paracetamol. You can use in any route, you can use it and um, um, there is no harm. And how do you monitor the efficacy of analgesia? The analgesia, mm. uh, actually uh, the scales as, as in the, um, uh, I also run pain clinic. So it is chronic pain. In chronic pain, some of the cases I go for combination therapy, but my neuropathic pain, as uh, Tagi said, that uh, the mainstay is the anticonvulsants. So gabapentin or pregabalin. Along with that, we can give paracetamol. Now, the pra paracetamol tramadol combination also I use in that cases. Mm -hmm. And the monitoring is monitoring is visual analog scale and all these scales as we have. But in neuro cases, you cannot go for that. Only the uh, parameters of cardiac parameters the heart rate, the uh, blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, you can uh, go for that. So um, these are the things. And in the ICU, ICU, we, we actually don't use um, analgesics too much. Uh, only for patients' spinal cases, I said that we go for instead in, in combination therapy, multimodal analgesics, some blocks and something, we, we always go for that. But uh, solitary paracetamol is not enough for this pain. The back pain, the back surgery, instrumentation, you cannot go for that. And in intracranial surgery, we don't need any analgesia, actually. We don't need any analgesia. And um, some patients, they get uh, um, anticonvulsants if they had um, uh, previously. And sometimes also, they um, uh, give uh, also an... Um, uh, anti-epileptics for some time in intracranial surgery. Dr. So Zilpe, would you like to add something for the neurocritical care? Uh, yes, what uh, Madam says is right. We never use it as a single agent in ICU. Generally, these patients are on a lot many supports. We always in a, use in a combination. And uh, of course, we can assess the pain. Uh, what uh, she is saying that in, because of the neuro patients, they are not in a state to give us uh, information, but you can have the bedside uh, scale where the sisters can judge day-to-day uh, -day in a, the three times or four times a day, ki what is the effect of that uh, painkiller. And, and let me tell you, this analysis plays a major role in a stroke patients and the, those because they are not able to tell us, they are not able to express their pain. Most of the time there is a bony pain, most of the time there is a muscle pain, not necessarily it is related with the uh, stroke. So. Definitely, it plays a major role, but not as a single agent. Single agent, uh, we need to think whether really that patient needs the uh, uh, analgesic. So, yes, it has a role in ICUs and the critical care. And possibly polytrauma, head injury with polytrauma. Yeah, again, they would require the something. Yeah. And, uh, see, when you are in a, uh, we are coming back to the polytrauma, I need chamadol, I need paracetamol, <coughs> I may need a Bueller patch. I may need the additional sometimes uh, epidural analgesia. So it depends on the extent of the polytrauma. But 
never a single never a uh, single agent we use as a paracetamol as a painkiller we always use it in a combination like if suppose there is chest trauma there is icd it is not a bony pain it is the muscle sprinting is there so i would like to have a tramadol with uh, paracetamol combination uh, which would work more as compared to the uh, paracetamol or dinapar alone because it's not the only bone pain so i need to say whether it is a patient needs analgesic or patient needs analgesic sedation or patient needs analgesic sedation and uh, anxiolytic so that according to that we have to choose whether patient needs uh, oral or bolus or infusion or might be uh, in a patient control analgesia so accordingly we can decide our uh, agents in icu uh dr balvia yes sir how do you the challenges which you face in the critical care for an analysis summarize uh, some terms yeah. nee this when the challenge is actually the assessment of the pain is a, a difficult choice with the uh is this just on empirical ground or behavioral pain scale usually patient on ventilator we do it and this is uh, most of the icus this is under uh, relief so require uh, it require the multimodal therapy on one hand the patient is compromised state with the various anatops and the uh, vasopressors with ventilator the pain is usually under treated due to sepsis the patient have a liver compromise hepatic dysfunction or renal dysfunction and you usually it is underestimated so, so it's absolutely, absolutely right so that required and the safety is uh, with the paracetamol this is a wonderful drug and uh, of course you know paracetamol is available for the last more than 50 years oral preparation unfortunately the iv preparation came in last uh, last decade this is unfortunate just to have uh, this one and we get paracetamol which has a much more safety a margin of safety and multimodal analgesia of course so that we can reduce the toxicity of the combination of drug we can should go ahead I mean, along with the neuroxial blockage if the surgical patient is there see unfortunately more attention in the icus is paid to the other vital signs you know, other vital signs. Way, not the pain yes yes sir sepsis, absolutely right. urine output rather yes. than the actual uh, yeah this one yes anybody can uh, yeah yeah please add Uh, pain is a fixed thing, vital sign that's my dedomidin so nowadays we are in neuro icu if you are uh, the patient is on ventilator and you are using dex then uh, it is no uh, um, paracetamol if you give you can have pain relief in many patients yes, yes. and in trauma yes, patient madam. you must relieve the pain by multimodal analgesia because in acute pain it will go to chronic pain afterwards so you have to address to the acute pain very right correctly with multimodal analgesia sir i i will add into that ki in icu i will be more concerned with the pain uh, pain killers and the painless patients rather than the along with the other signs so uh, every day we would like to see that our patients are smiling sitting in chair comfortably less restless they are moving uh, in bed comfortably they are communicating so for this we need to be patient pain free and i i always say that the these are the these are the things which give you the comfort to the patient doctor as well as the relatives so pain is one of the prime important in uh, critical care areas absolutely yeah. dr malvi any comment absolutely. on malingering malingerers oh, <laughs> this is a, a one of the very common problem and this is a, a it is very difficult to decide whether it is mangling or patient is having really a pain and especially the isme this is females coming from rural background in the especially northeast up this is the main problem it's a difficult to assess <laughs> if oh, you have yeah. any idea how to assess and find it they are mangling no, you had a few patients you had a few uh-huh. patients who i mean who were used to analgesics you know who were yes. taking some and they would malinger that they need to and these uh, patient system. usually require antidepressant not analgesic and then, then they come out i have the one dr mohammed ibrahim has asked a couple of questions that what about allergic reaction has anybody any of us can answer that allergic reaction to paracetamol well i haven't seen any till now fortunately i never came across no 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 i also never seen any, any allergic reaction with the paracetamol till date 
And one more question he has. Yeah, any dose adjustment for along with antivirus, for example, pavipiravir? Unless and until there is a liver involvement. Yeah. So generally, we do the LFTs daily or alternate day. If the patient is on the remdesivir, we do it daily. And if it's three times more, we have to uh, stop the that particular dose of the remdesivir and flavipiravir. So uh, if there is a, a high risk patient, those patients who are alcoholic or patients have the underlying liver disease, ideally, we never prescribe the antivirals to these patients. So we have to keep monitoring. It's not that you should not prescribe the paracetamol. That's what my personal opinion is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. So some people stop it at five times the uh, LFTs. Yes, yes. Just three times would be reasonable, I suppose. Yeah. And yeah. one question is how about using propofol MCT LCT versus propofol LCT? Any experience, sir, for a pain due to propofol injection? Ranveer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you can give a, uh, using no. propofol, you can give a gylo card before one uh, one milligram per kg body weight, you do not feel pain after giving the uh, 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 gylo card and then you give propofol better. No, also MCT, LCT is supposed to be less painful than uh, uh, the... Uh, less the painful, but I still feel you sometimes the size of vein or where you put the intracare, they all depend on these conditions also. <laughs> Of course, MCT LCT preparations are less painful. Yeah. And the previously, the way initially we get the propofol, there was a company, I think uh, somebody has made a propofol lignocaine combination also. Yeah, yeah. Mix, <laughs> initially, when it came in the market, and that was administered to relieve the pain, but it will not reduce the incidence of thrombophlebitis. It will be equally there. The pain will be, of course, not there at the time of injection, but later on, it will create problems. MCT LCT preparation are definite advantages. So, how to select drugs depending on intensity and type of pain? Any of you can comment. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Intensity. How do you select your drug depending on Sir, uh, severity of the pain? Yeah, basically, we need to say why there is a pain. Whether it is a neurogenic pain, yes. whether it is a bony pain, whether it is a muscular pain. Or because uh, of the inner. So we select the uh, painkiller agent as per the which pain we are targeting. And uh, in ICU, I told you that the pain is multifactorial. It cannot be the because of the single factor. So uh, we need to have combinations. And the combinations were decided by the patient's diagnosis, patient general condition at that on that day at that time, and the patient progress. Like for example, I say now okay, whether patient needs plain analgesics or patient needs. Analgesia plus uh, angiolytic or patient need analgesia sedation plus uh, so accordingly we'll choose and the even I am concerned with the drug delivery it is not like that key only IV drugs I will push or bolus drug might be I will con uh, have a combination of the infusion with the, uh, IV or infusion uh, combination so sometimes there is a, a fentanyl and the, the single tramadol go uh, the uh, fentanyl go or sometimes there is a tramadol paracetamol and in additional doses, bevel patch will go. So it depends on the what type of the pain you are targeting. It depends on the what is the condition of the patient. It depends what urgency is to make the patient. See, uh, if the, my patient is on ventilator, like uh, what you said, the polytrauma patient is on ventilator, I need good analgesics to reduce the use of the sedation. So if I, I, I would like to use, reduce the use of the sedation because my neurosurgeons would like to have patients in a more conscious state. And if they want a more consciousness, I need to have a less sedative and more potent analgesic. So I need to make a combination of good analgesia with less sedation. So these patients generally requires even no paralyzing agent, less sedation, and they will be managed by the uh, painkiller. So this is where we have to have a good uh, combination about uh, the various analgesic agents and as per the indication. Less is spoken about the uh, the most <coughs> fundamental part of uh, multimodal uh, analgesia uh, is the uh, point of care uh, ultrasound guided uh, and peripheral now blocks uh, wherever whenever possible uh, whether it is in uh, acute post op setting or in an intensive care unit wherever possible whenever possible please administer uh, uh, peripheral nerve block uh, preferably ultrasound guided so that uh, that is going to reduce most of your pain. 
and that is going to be the cornerstone of uh, amma and one other thing is this paracetamol though it is a simple uh, analgesic it it has found a place in all the three steps of the ladder suggested by who whether it is going to be stage 1 stage 2 or stage 3 uh, whether alone or in combination of much more uh, potent drugs and also uh, when you use paracetamol in addition to other drugs so you, know, you are trying to tap the synergy uh, by a complementary mode of action uh, so that is where you can reduce the dosage of either drug and then reduce the side effects too so paracetamol though it's a simple drug it can be added or it given in conjunction with other drugs to make it the make the combination work as a potent uh, potent combo see in my opinion Paras, IV paracetamol, <laughs> at least for surgical pain, it remains the backbone of surgical pain because that would be given. I mean, at least for the first couple of days after surgery, and then you can supplement it unless the patient is on PCA pump or something like that for very severe uh, severe pain because it is completely safe. Not only in liver and hepatic, otherwise also there is no respiratory depression. You don't need to worry about. So what will be the uh, uh, bolus dose that is given? what is the maximum uh, dosage that can be given as a single bolus uh, when you administer intraoperatively any take somebody any experience like I more than 1 gram no generally yeah. we don't it suggested the 2 gram 2 grams 2 grams uh, supposed to be like uh, giving a better benefit more uh, potent and effective as compared to the 1 gram yeah and they say uh, up to 3 grams but 2 grams i feel is safer <laughs> Uh, in, in in patients who don't have any hepatic impairment or renal impairment, that's maybe to put it like that, uh, it is better to give two grams two to, grams. to fact, get the maximum. Fact, uh, there there was a good uh, paper on so the two gram versus one gram, and they say that the two gram is more effective in initial control of the pain, and then you can maintain with the lesser doses. So initially, if you uh, control that uh, surge of the pain, like uh, I know, sir, but then uh, uh, this absolute right. Oh, yeah, yeah, is the wonder. My I I, I know the the, the concept of concept of preemptive analgesia comes into the play, but then literature does not support, or uh, it has a uh, lot of controversies regarding the effectiveness of preemptive analgesia. But still, a larger bolus dose helps, maybe yes. to bring down the subsequent doses or, uh, or need for uh, that is uh, your uh, uh, opioid free uh, an- analgesics. Uh, Uh, agree, agree, fully agree. There's no role nowadays on preemptive analgesia. If you are going for a surgery and postoperative, then preemptive analgesia is there is no role of preemptive analgesia. So But after it's surgery, a very controversial sub- topic, madam. There are, <laughs> are a lot of studies which approves, and then there are a lot which disapproves preemptive. If you have preemptive analgesia, device, device, device yeah. you can monitor also. and what is the dose you can give and you have you have a continuous infusion bolus we don't use actually uh, for continuous infusion in a pca device you can go for that and sometimes if the patient needs then you can give some bolus and uh, that is a, and multimodal analgesia is always preferable because only paracetamol in a, in a patient who, who has um, neurological pain neuro neuro um, i mean um, neuralgic pain so you cannot go for only this one it will not go, do any good and in cases of patients having burning sensation and uh, neuropathic uh, component is there so you can address both neuropathic and analgesic um, um, with uh, so these are the things it is individualized all the patients are individualized you can go for a combined combined things and then the peripheral nerve blocks also usg guided you have in your icu you can go for usg guided blocks if uh, needed along with that some paracetamol paracetamol is now is uh, i mean routinely used uh, in the post operative period in the intraoperative period in our setup it is used routinely and along with that we can add something and then you monitor the patient for liver function as uh, kapil said you can go for uh, liver function monitoring and all these things do anybody use coxip still uh, uh, and in uh, if so in uh, 
uh, in which uh, context that you use coccyps? Uh, maybe in orthopedics or uh, do you still use coccyps? Yeah, in orthopedics, they use because I have personal experience when I had a, a ankle avulsion and postoperative. When you use clutches, now your shoulders are generally the, your shoulders and these muscles get severely uh, this thing. So if you take the 60 milligram OD along with the good physiotherapy, that is a very, very it, it is a wonderful drug. Believe me, it's a wonderful drug with the uh, immediate uh, effect on that. So I have very personal experience with that, and I'm very happy with that drug. But again, a very particularly uh, indication, not in ICU or not in critical uh, care situation. What you said is the orthopedic. The orthopedic use oh, yeah. in a very regularly uh, in their uh, bony pains or muscular pains generally. The thromboembolic events and the cardiovascular events uh, that are possible uh, uh, quoted side effects of uh, coccyps. Right? 60 uh, milligram so, OD dose is not very high. They are dose related and the, uh, duration related. So yeah, 60 milligram, I don't think OD dose will uh, harm uh, anything about uh, this thing. Only in high risk patient, you have to be more careful. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have covered almost all aspects of analgesia in uh, intensive care, including uh, the uses of paracetamol. So I was just summarizing what we have basically discussed that multimodal analgesia is better, sensitivity to patient's pain and looking for it, and titrating the adequate doses and adequate modality for a particular severity of pain is important. And paracetamol is a safe, IV paracetamol is a very safe drug, including a liver and hepatic uh, dysfunction. And you can add stronger or better drugs for more severe pain. So with that note, I would like to thank all the participants, all the participants and the panelists and the speakers for a very interesting uh, evening. Uh, nothing like the Saturday evening talking about analgesia. <laughs> and I would hand over the mic to... Thank, thank you very much for the excellent thank you, and thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you everybody thank, thank you thank, thank you happy navratra to all stay stay healthy same to you would Kim like to say something sandeep yeah so sandeep you are mute sandeep yeah 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 sorry sir i will take a few minutes uh, uh, means not me uh, for the audience and uh, for all of you, we have a small audiovisual because this is the platform we, do, we take uh, to launch our uh, paracetamol flexi, flexi bag. Just today we are launching this occasion of the world of world yeah. session. <laughs> so just we will take two, three minutes. Yeah, Binay? Greetings from Alchem Laboratories. Doctor, as you know that Alchem is the fifth largest pharmaceutical company in India and present in all major therapy areas. Globally, Alchem is present in 56 countries and having strong presence in US market with more than 125 ANDAs. Doctor, Alchem Laboratories has 14 Hello. brands in the top 300 brands wow. with a strong presence in pain management. In this segment, Alchem has brands like Sumo, Enzoflam, Hospimol, Gemcal, Uprise D3 and many more. Doctor, Alchem Hospicare is the highest growing company in critical care in financial year 2020. It is perceived as the true ICU care division of Alchem. Hospicare is dedicated towards serving critical care and it stands notable among the fraternity for need of quality medicines. Doctor, pain management is an integral part of the treatment in hospital care. Paracetamol is the most preferred molecule for primary pain and fever management due to the safety profile. Available paracetamol containers are conventional and difficult to handle. Hence, need of the hour is novel approach. Paracetamol is the most widely used molecule in hospital service since 1880s. IV paracetamol reaches a significantly higher 70% maximum concentration within 15 minutes of infusion 
and so is one of the most favorable NSAID. A study in moderate number of patients shows that paracetamol reduces the requirement of opioids, a decrease by 14.9%. IV paracetamol has broad compatibility with other analgesics. IV paracetamol improves pain relief, expedites mobilization and rehabilitation and reduces health care costs. Introducing a novel drug delivery system, Hospimol FlexiBand ensures quality with flexibility. Dr. Hospimol FlexiBag offers Closed infusion system to maintain aseptic conditions. Hospimol Flexi Bag has two ports, hence, no external venting is required. Doctor, Hospimol Flexi Bag is a self collapsible or flexible non PVC bag which provides greater durability. Hospimol Flexi Bag is also environment friendly. Unlike other PVC bags, it does not release toxins of HCL and is DEHP free. Doctor, Hospimol Flexi Bag is easier to dispose as compared to other containers. Hospimol Flexi Bag has reduced weight and there are no chances of breakage. Doctor, Hospimol Flexi Bag provides triple E benefit ease of handling, ease of storage, and Ease on environment. Doctor, please prescribe Hospimol Flexi Bag to your next patient to ensure quality with flexibility. Doctor, Hospimol Flexi Bag is available in your hospital pharmacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Mehta, for uh, being there for so long. Dr. Malviya, Dr. Das, Dr. Uh, TNS, Dr. Ranveer Tagi and Dr. Jirte. So I'm really thankful personally uh, to come uh, just in one call. And uh, we, we would like to wish uh, uh, great success of the uh, new introductions. And we'll be in touch with you very soon. This is a fantastic uh, discussion of the pain management and definitely audience has been benefited out of that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank wish you. all the success of hospital mall. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mehta Hyman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Thank you, Dr. Das. Dr. Dr. TNS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aggie. Thank you, Dr. Aggie. Namaste, madam. Vibhuti. Namaste. Thank you. Once again. Bye. See you all. We enjoyed.